Well, good morning. Last week we uh, noted that Paul was calling the Thessalonians to live differently to the rest of their community as to those within the, the Roman culture. They were to sanctify themselves. They were to live in a way that was pleasing to God. They were to avoid sexual immorality that was running rampant throughout their society. And the challenge for us was to continue to allow God to point out to us where we too need to be sanctified where and how we need to become more like Jesus. And following directly on from this, Paul now calls them to another contrast to those who live in their community. In essence, he's saying, we don't want you to grieve for those that you have lost, to grieve for your lost loved ones like the rest of those around you who have no hope. Neither do we want you to live in ignorance and therefore uncertain about your future. Evidently, there were some, if not all of those believers in Thessalonica who were grieving, grieving the loss of loved ones, and they were uncertain about their own future. And so through a knowledge of the truth, as opposed to being ignorant or uninformed, as verse 13 suggests, they would then possess a hope that would take away any uncertainty that they might have about their own future and significantly reduce the level of their own grief. They would still grieve, as we all do, but not like those who have no hope. There's such a a vast difference between the funeral for a Christian and the funeral for a non-Christian. Noticed over the years, conducted many funerals, those who have no faith, no faith in the Lord, those who remain are absolutely distraught. The very first funeral ever conducted was for a non-Christian girl, an 18-year-old, and the family was so distraught. They couldn't see how they could go on without their daughter. Such funerals, people are often overcome with emotion. They cry their way through the service in Deep, heartfelt tears. There's just no hope. The religions of the world have no certainty of a glorious future. They have no assurance as Christianity does. Because their only hope is on the basis of merit, that their good deeds might outweigh their bad. So we're going to look at First Thessalonians 4, 13 through to 18. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who fall asleep so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Just had a thought, the trumpet call of God. Can you just imagine, not just one trumpet, but a vast array of trumpets, just blasting it all out there, Jesus has returned. It'll be incredible. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, when Timothy had returned back to Paul and Silas, he brought such a glowing report of the church in Thessalonica. They were so encouraged, but he also must have brought back some concerns. Concerns about the effect that the Roman culture was having on those in the church, their upbringing, what that had had upon their, up, their uh, 
the way that they were living their lives and their faith, their lack of understanding about what actually follows death. They were uninformed, were ignorant. We don't want you to grieve like those around you. And so be encouraged and encourage one another with these truths. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him and we will all meet him in the air. We will all meet Jesus in the air. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that death will be the last enemy to be destroyed. The last enemy to be destroyed. The reason that death is the last and greatest of our enemies to be destroyed is because nothing separates us from one another like death. Nothing here on earth ends a relationship like death. There's no reset button. There's no restart. That's it. If a relationship is bad when death comes, then there's the pain of never being able to go back and make that relationship right. It's just not possible. If a relationship is good, then there's the pain of it all being over and life's not as good as it once was. And if death comes early, then there's always the wondering of what could have been as if something's been stolen. For those who are left, death is the separation between the time that we saw them and when we might see them again. Or if we'll ever see them again. And so death is not only our enemy, but it stings. Death seems to have the victory. The death of a loved one can leave us defeated, discouraged and even depressed. And sometimes the tears that fill our eyes can hinder our vision of what is really true and what is yet to come. We struggle to see through the tears for a brighter day. But for the believer, death has lost its sting. 1 Corinthians 15, again, Paul teaches that based upon Jesus' resurrection and based upon a number of facts, that, that Jesus appeared to over 500 of his brothers and sisters in Christ and Jesus being the first fruits of all who will be raised to eternal life through faith in him, death has lost its sting. Vance Havner was a preacher, he was a writer through last century and he was 72 when his wife died in 1973. He later told the story of his wife's funeral and he was standing at the casket, which is what they do in America, and people were filing by and trying to console him with all kinds of, of words these kinds of words, we're so sorry about your loss. Vance, we're so sorry that you've lost your wife. And after a while he couldn't take it any longer and he responded. You haven't lost anything if you know where it is. You haven't lost anything if you know where it is. And Paul seeks to encourage the Thessalonians with such teaching. Encourage us. Death has lost its sting. We don't want you to grieve like those who are not in Christ. For us a day will come when we will meet the Lord in the air, we'll be re reunited with loved ones who have gone on before and united with the Lord. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. It's a promise. And it's a precious promise for the believer. The Lord will return. Jesus promised that he would return in John 14, 3. If I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come back and I'll take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Jesus is coming again. 
verse 16 from our leading, reading from the the Lord himself shall descend, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. One day Jesus is going to return. And he'll return in dramatic fashion, in glorious majesty. And life as we know it here on earth will just draw to a close. He finished. He's promised to return. And he's promised us a reunion. Verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Those who have died in Christ will rise. Then those along with those who still remain here on earth will all simultaneously meet together with the Lord in the air. We'll be reunited with those who are in Christ, our loved ones who have gone on before. But I think, my guess is, we'll be less concerned about re being reunited with those who we have loved and who have gone on before about Rather, being in the presence of the Lord, our Saviour. My guess is, each one of us, our eyes will be firmly fixed on Jesus. And this promise extends beyond the reunion with other Christians to the completed union with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. The close of verse 17 says... And so we will be with the Lord for tomorrow, forever. We will be with the Lord forever. The promise is that we will take up residence with him. We will reside with the Lord. We'll see him face to face and we'll be with him. 1 John 3, 2, the Apostle John. He wrote this, Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But what we do know is that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As I mentioned before, Jesus also said, I'll come back, I'll take you to be with me that you will be where I am. We're going to spend eternity with our Lord and Saviour who has redeemed us. It's not a temporary gathering. It's our eternal dwelling place. So Jesus promises us that he'll return, that we'll be reunited with all believers, that we will take up residence, we will be residing with him, and he promises us, promises us rest. Jesus told us when he returns in Revelation, he will, the book of Revelation, he will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne will declare, I am making everything new. And in Revelation 14, 13, he also said this to the Apostle John. Write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, for they will rest from their labour, for their deeds will follow them. They'll rest from their labours. What a beautiful picture of, of rest, of peace. There's no more death, grieving, mourning, tear or tears or pain. And Jesus called this place paradise. You think back to the Garden of, Geth uh, Garden of Eden. Why was it paradise? Not just because it was a beautiful garden, but because Adam and Eve were communing without any sin with God. This was where God lived. 
Jesus calls heaven paradise. It's where God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit reside, where they commune. It's the place of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And when we get there, every human being will have complete self-control. That'll be paradise. We'll be like Christ in paradise. We're about to share in communion. So I invite you to, to get your emblems together. And as we're going to share in communion, in communion we're reminded of Jesus' death on the cross. And as, as he hung there on the cross before his death, a thief either side, one thief on one side of him, places his faith in Jesus and asks him to remember him once he's come into his kingdom. And Jesus said to this, this thief, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can you imagine hanging on a cross in severe pain and torment, this is not paradise. This is horrible. And the thief had committed a crime that his society had deemed was bad enough that he received the death penalty. You as a thief, you hanging there on that cross, you deserve death. And the thief recognised that. The depth of his own sin, he was receiving just punishment. For he says to the other thief, we're getting what we deserve. We deserve the death penalty. And Jesus, also on a cross, his death pays the price for this man's sin. Today you will be with me in paradise. The wonder of this transaction, Jesus' death brings us eternal life. Gives us such hope. Let's give thanks. Father, as we hold this bread again, we give thanks for Jesus and the incredible transaction that takes place upon his death, this bread reminding us of, of Jesus dying on the cross, the transaction that his death brings us eternal life and the hope that is ours, the joy in which we look forward to the glory of heaven, paradise. Father, we thank you that as the thief experienced that day, and as he declared, I'm getting just what I deserve, the death penalty. And that's really what we all deserve. But Jesus' death has paid the price for our sin. We praise your name as we take and eat now in remembrance of our Saviour. Amen. Let's eat together. And Father, as we hold this cup, we thank you again that it reminds us, it is a symbol to us of Jesus' blood poured out for us. Once again, we take and we drink because we 
of recommitting ourselves to you in adoration and praise, giving you all the glory, thanking you for the forgiveness that is ours and eternal life. We praise your name as we drink now, remembering Jesus. Amen. And so as Christians, the future that we anticipate, the hope that is set before us, greatly influences the life that we live today. Or it should do. We don't grieve the way that the world grieves. Neither do we fear death because we understand it to be just a transition from life here on earth to life in glory. We see it as our graduation. Paul closes his thoughts with this statement, verse 18. Therefore, because of these truths that he's just been sharing with us, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Remembering he's writing to believers who at yet were uninformed, were ignorant about eternal life and, and the hope. So he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. I'm sure these words did just that, brought such encouragement. It's because of these truths that we, we anticipate death without fear and apprehension, rather with joy and peace. We don't hang on to our earthly existence as though, as though it's all that we have. We've been promised Jesus' return, promised that being reunited with other believers, been promised to reside in his presence, promised to be at rest. I want to close with a true story about a ship that sank in 1914. It was a ship called the Empress of Ireland. And this ship sank after colliding with another ship, the SS Storstad. The Empress was carrying 1,477 passengers and crew and 1,012 perished in the cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean. As the ship began to sink, it was discovered that there weren't enough life vests on board for enough to go around. On board the Empress were 167 members of the Salvation Army. And as they could, each one of them gave their life vest to others on board who didn't have one. And all but eight of the Salvation Army died. And those eight didn't have a life vest on. One of them was later asked, why would you do this? And his answer was, I could die better than them. I could die better than them. Christians can grieve better than those who have no hope. Christians can live better because they do so without fear of death. And Christians can die better than the rest of mankind because of our hope and the assurance of eternal life. We can die better. Are you ready for death to knock on your door? And could you give away a life vest because you do not fear death? Would you be ready to do that? Give it away. The only way to trust in these promises of Jesus' return, our reunion, residing in glory and in rest, is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Is he your Lord and Saviour? And you can ask him to be just that today. But as we come into times of grief, 
we're encouraged to encourage one another with these words that Paul has shared with us today. Encourage one another with these words. 